we're probably just going to give folks a couple more minutes. So we'll probably get started maybe um, 11.02. Hi everyone, and welcome to the session. We're going to go ahead and start it in like a, a minute or so. I was going to see if anyone else wants to is going to be able to join first. Okay, how about we just, um, we're going to go ahead and get started then. Uh, thank you all so very much for spending your late morning or early afternoon or evening, wherever you all are, uh, just to join us and to talk more about our, our studio in Quattro. So a little bit about scoping within this, there's no slides whatsoever for this. So uh, the, at the May faculty workshop, I ran another R session or another session and the feedback over the semester as well was that more hands-on, less slides. So I do want to mention at the end of the session, Nazia is going to go ahead and post a feedback survey on there. Please do fill it out because that's really helpful for me to figure out what's working, what's not working, what do people want to see more of or less of. So I really use that as well to kind of figure out and plan for different events and different workshop materials. Uh, so I heard y'all comments about last time, what was working, what wasn't working. So really wanted to implement those in this one. So before we begin, a couple of quick announcements and things I'm really excited to talk about. Uh, one quick announcement I wanted to mention, um, as some of you might know about the potential of a UPL strike next week. Um, right now, I wanted to mention that Tiffany and I don't have any blocks or any openings for consultations currently. Just in case there's a strike, we don't want to have the meetings scheduled and then not be there. However, that's subject to change if an agreement is met for the contract. So I just want to mention that really quickly. So as soon as the contract's ratified, we'll go ahead and unblock the time. That way we can meet with you because we really love talking with you about your research and being of any help that we can be. I also mentioned some really exciting news that we're working on too. Uh, so we have a lot of really fantastic events that are going to be planned out for this upcoming fall. For research methods, both qualitative, survey, and quantitative. So, so I really can't wait to share that information with you all. We're hoping to send out an announcement about that in the next couple of weeks once the semester starts and things kind of quiet down. So we have a lot of really cool programming set for you all. I also mentioned too that uh, some new things we're going to be doing. When that announcement goes out, there's also going to be an announcement that the release of an R Canvas learning modules on Canvas. So I'm fine tuning those and finishing recording those. So it's going to be an, an option where if you want to learn more on R and you kind of want to do this asynchronously on your own pace, it's going to be a whole series from everything of how to import data, configuration, working with data, cleaning it, running univariate tests, multivariate tests, data visualizations. Um, latent variable modeling, item response theory, a whole whole slew of things all within R. So working on that, that's going to be released this fall. So really happy about that. It's been a work in progress for a while. And then we're also going to be starting um, 
still trying to figure out, work out the details, but it'll be part of the announcement as well. There's going to be drop-in R coding virtually. So it's going to be a couple hours every other week. That's set. So if you wanted to drop into the Zoom room, and then it's essentially, if you're interested in moot transitioning to R, maybe taking your class and moving it from like Stata or SPSS or SAS to R, um, I can work with you and really work on the code and get everything and kind of help you out with that. So that's uh, some really fun stuff we've been looking forward to. So be on the lookout in the next couple of weeks for the email announcement of programming, the R Canvas page, and the R Office Hours. Um, so again, it's going to be more for, um, these are the consultations or faculty facing, uh, for faculty-led research or doctoral students working on the dissertations or the doc research. Um, but again, happy to meet and happy to chat more. Um, so those are kind of my announcements that I have. And I figured, let's go ahead and start opening a car and I'll just kind of walk you around. So this session is meant to, if you have experience with R, that's fantastic. If you've never used R, that's fantastic too. I'm working under the assumption that you're brand new to R in R Studio in Quattro. Um, I'm a little new to Quattro as well. It was just released like less than a month and a half ago. It is a fantastic, fantastic system. It's like a, it's the next generation of R Markdown files. So if you're not familiar with R Markdown, that's okay too. I'm gonna walk you through it. So uh, before we go ahead and do this, I wanted to check in with y'all and see, was everyone able to install R Studio, um, R, and then Quattro? Was everyone able to get that? Okay, so I see some thumbs up. That's awesome. Um, if you ran into any issues with it, let me know. If you want to follow along, and then I can always meet with you afterwards and double check some things. If you want, if that's helpful too, just let me know. Always happy to help out with this. So let me go ahead and I'm going to just go ahead and start sharing my screen. Uh, can you all see a uh, file explorer it has a bunch of files open in it? Perfect, perfect. So there's actually, um, so we're gonna be using this HS SPSS data set. This is the Holzinger and Swineford 1939 data set. Um, I'm in a love-hate relationship with this data set. This is the data set I was trained on in grad school. So we always use this data set. So I'm kind of sick of it, but it's really, really good as a kind of a toy data set. So there's actually um, two .qmd files and the QMD just means it's a Quattro file. So that way, it can kind of knit and you get some really, really nice output. That's you can also do annotations with. We're not going to using base R for this. We're not going to using R Markdown, but I'm going to show you how to what, kind of go through this. Um, so the crash course code, that's actually, um, it has more bells and whistles than we're going to cover today. But I wanted to give you kind of a final product that you can kind of see what it looks like. I'm going to open up the template one and do a lot of live coding rather than just kind of running stuff. So I want you to be able to kind of practice with the coding. And it's okay, I'm gonna make mistakes in this next um, hour and 10 minutes, just because I know myself. And when it comes to live coding, it's it's like, what are my fingers doing? That's that's not how you spell that word. And so it's gonna happen and just, that's part of the process. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and just open up both scripts. And you can have multiple uh, session scripts open at the same time, that's perfectly okay. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna open up the data set that we can kind of see what it looks like just before we pull it into R. And there we go, it's slowly opening. Uh, so I'm trying to open up an SPSS and uh, here we go. So for any of you who use SPSS, this is kind of what the data set looks like, just to kind of give you all an idea of what we're going to be working with. I'm also going to pull this up in R, just to kind of show that, yep, it's the same thing. But just to kind of get an idea, it's always helpful to get an idea of the data set before you enter, just to make sure it's entering in correctly and that things haven't gone horribly, horribly wrong. So now that we have everything set up, let me talk a little bit about R and R Studio. So I highly recommend using R Studio. It's a fantastic interface because you can have your code, you can have your output. You can also see all the objects or all the variables or all the data sets that you have in this upper right quadrant. So it's divided in quadrants. So you have your code, 
you have your console where you, sometimes you'll have a lot of like output printed out environments and then you can also go ahead and look at what or what packages you have, what files, if you have plots, and so forth. So they try to make it really user-friendly. There's also tutorials built into the newest versions of RStudio. So if you're just starting out, you can actually start the tutorials and learn R within R. So highly, highly recommend. So a couple of differences. So if you've ever used like regular R scripts, then you probably won't see what's called this, this YAML header. So this is essentially a header of a document. The idea is that when we knit it, when we sometimes what's called rendering, that's going to go ahead and transfer this code into an HTML or a PDF or a Word document. The nice thing too is it's flipped. So all the code, it's actually assuming all this is comments or annotations. And whenever you want to have a code, we have what's called a code chunk. So let's say I'm using the R program and here's my R code. So it's flipped compared to just base R, which makes it really helpful if you're teaching with it or if you're using it for tutorials or just even for yourself as you're running analyses, that we can kind of keep track. So you can actually have your code in your research log in the same file rather than just a whole bunch of comments out. So I wanna show you the end goal first before we do any sort of coding. So, this is gonna be the end product that we're gonna start working towards as part of this live coding session. Uh, so I, what I did was I clicked on render and it went ahead and it's running the code and it's rendering the information. So one of the codes I'll show you how to do is it's a data frame summary. These allow you really quick checks of your data set to see, okay, what's the, main, the mean, minimum, maximum, frequencies, percent missing, in histograms. So if you have categorical data, you get the frequency. So it's a really, really quick way to have a data dictionary as an HTML page. Uh, so that's a newer feature, but, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. Um, there's also a bunch of, actually, here we go. So the nice thing is as an end result, when you run all your code, is you have annotations within this. This is something you can actually post on GitHub quite easily. So it has all of our comments. It has hyperlinks in it. It generates tables that, and you can also put images in there. Um, we can go ahead and look at the code. We can also, people can also copy this into a clipboard to run in a different program. So the nice thing is you can run your analysis and write up the results. So this can actually be really useful for like reports or even just homework assignments. I've seen some folks over at MathStat within their programs, they actually use our markdowns and they, so the students just submit the R markdown as like a PDF or an HTML page. And that way you can have a track record of everything that's done. You can have interpretations in there. So it's really, really flexible too. Uh, so there's a whole lot in here again. I, I put, I was probably overzealous in terms of all the coding within, but that way it kind of gives you a quick highlights of univariate tests. And some really quick visuals and then like regression and some different techniques that I really like. But this is all, this can be stored as a, a Word document, a PDF, an HTML. So it really depends on your preferences within it. The default is HTML, but it makes it easier to go ahead and you can just send this file with the data set. Someone else can make changes to it, edit to it, and just replicate your data. The nice thing is because we're not changing any data sets directly into like the raw data file, any changes we make to the data set, it's all within your script. So as long as they have the raw data in your script, they should be able to replicate it no, no problem whatsoever. So that's a really big benefit of this. Oh, there's also some new features added here too. I love this check model because it gives you the highlights of all the different assumptions of your analyses. And like, did you violate an assumption? So it's really, really powerful. Uh, it does look like a lot of coding, but I'm going to walk through it together. So I just want to kind of show you what the end result could be. And the nice thing is, if you have someone has a SAS data set, state of data set, SPSS, Excel, whatever, you can read it into R. You can also write it as like a DTA file for set for data. You can write a clean version of the data set to SPSS if like a, co a collaborator is working with SPSS. So it really allows you a lot of flexibility. Um, so let's go ahead and I'm going to switch over to the template and we're going to walk through some and kind of just 
start doing some live coding within this. One thing I do want to mention is in our studio, actually, um, I usually use dark mode when I code. I just want to give, give a quick check. I can invert the color scheme and have it be black text on a white background. I want to make sure whatever's easier to read. Um, so if you prefer a dark mode and this is working fine, go ahead, give me a thumbs up. If you want me to invert the colors, give me a thumbs down. Just give me a quick check because I want to make sure whatever works out best for everyone, I want to do that. Okay. So let me extend this. I see a lot of thumbs up. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and leave it. Um, the nice thing is if you ever want to check those changes, you can do a lot of customization. So under tools, there's a global settings feature. So you can change the appearance. So uh, you can change the text size, the font. I like Dracula just because like it's Dracula, so like cool. But you can really customize it and really make it your own. So whatever make works out best for you, you can make those changes to it. Um, the new feature too with this is what's called a visual writer. So when you're using the visuals, so rather than seeing all the code, you can actually just see the final. Oops, I'm gonna move this over. Oh, there we go. So this is just all the code. I like working with them this way too, but if it's easier to kind of just see what it would look like in the end result, it does allow what's called a visual editor. The nice thing within this, it gives you all the highlights. If you're familiar with R Markdown, you don't have to remember all the coding because it added like bullet points, how to insert stuff, insert tables. So, so you can use those quickly and they'll automatically put it in your R script. So you can get an idea of what it's gonna look like as a preview before you actually render it too. So it really makes it, it's a nice feature. So I'm going to switch back to source, uh, but we're going to go ahead and start with the template. So you can always change the code here. So if you want to change the title, you can do that. You can also add emoticons, which is pretty cool, the emojis. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put my name here. And then this is just, it's going to automatic. So whatever today's date is, it's going to go ahead and use that. You can go ahead and make it like, a static date instead of a dynamic. That's perfectly fine. It's all personal preference. I like this version better, but that's each their own. Now, if you wanted to start a brand new file, what you would do is go to File, New File, and you can go ahead and then select on Quattro Document. And now go ahead and you can make some of the specifications there. That's a brand new Quattro Document. If you want to do it as a presentation, like a slide deck, you can also do Quattro presentation too. So that's another feature. I see a lot of, a lot of conferences. Uh, for now, we're going to go ahead and use this template one because I added some built-in code to make it easier to get the to download and install packages just in case uh, there were any issues or if you needed to reinstall it. So the nice thing is we have headers here. So it's kind of a, if you want to quickly go to different headers, so whenever we have like a header where it's just one hashtag, that's going to be our level one header. Our level two is going to have two. And if we do like a three, we can kind of see it's kind of subdivided within there. So if you want to use outlines to go back and forth within code, you can do that. You don't necessarily have to, but it really gives you a lot of flexibility. And you'll also see this within like the visual and how it's structured for it. So it's going to quickly do, so we can kind of see the different sizes within that. And you can also change the headers here and kind of choose which one to. So if you don't remember the specific coding, that's okay. Start with the visual and you can always make changes to it. Like let's say I wanted to do a table. I can go ahead and just click on table within the visual, insert table, um, let's do a three by two. My awesome table. And I can just go ahead and one, two, project three, one, two, three. I'm just kind of making something up. But when I switch over to source code, it's automatically created what I would need to write in R to be able to have that within the Quattro document. Some really cool things about Quattro. 
Um, if you have a Python user, you can use Python in this. You don't have to use R. If you're using Julia, which is a really, really fast program, you can also work it there. You can also like mix and match what interface. So if you want to use R, Python, and Julia in the same document, you can. There's a lot going on there, but you, you most certainly can do that. Uh, you have to have it pass stuff back and forth to it, but there's packages that allow that. So what we do now is we actually start creating an object so, and start using what's called a chunk. So if I ever wanted to create a new chunk, what I can do is I can either manually type that in, or there's a little, it says C, green C squared with a plus symbol. If you click on that, that's gonna go ahead and insert a new chunk. So you can also do that too. It's all the same thing. They try to make it as easy as possible to getting started with this. So it's really come a long way. So R is what's called an object-oriented language. So an object can be, it can be a data frame or a data set. It could be a list or a vector of different values. It could be a table. It could be a result of an analysis. So it can actually be a lot of different things. It can also be like a figure you would create it. So an object is whatever you assign something to be. So if I go ahead and do A, I like using this assignment symbol. That's what I've been used to, but you can also do A or B equals A. So either one of those is fine. If I go ahead and click on this, run on this little play button, it's going to go ahead and now we have new values. We have an object called A and an object called B. I can also create, I should go ahead and move down to a new chunk. I'm going to create a vector or a list. So you would have to do is you have to do something called um, C, parentheses, and I'll do one, two, three, four, five. And I can also do D. And it could be a, a, a list of, let's say, let's go ahead and say, Eric, Tiffany. So I can create a numerical list and also a list of characters. And I can also kind of combine these. So it really allows you then to start going ahead and creating a data set. Um, so you can also, if you wanted to run all the chunks that are above like this chunk, you don't have to merely click on all of these. You can click on this one. It's going to run everything above it. Or you can click on run, and then you can choose like selected or all, run all. We're not going to use the run all yet, but there's different ways you can do this. Now, something I want to mention about R is if you when you first download it, you have a small selected number of libraries or R patches that come as part of your system library. I have a lot. Um, I think I have like 800 or 900 I have in here. Uh, you don't need all of them. You just kind of, for different functions or different things you're running, it's, some packages are better than others. So a lot of the functionality in R is these packages. It allows you more versatility. You can do more specialized analogy or analyses, like if you're doing structural equationing modeling or Bayesian structural equation modeling or atom response theory. Maybe you're using you're doing some spatial analyses. There's specific packages and multiple packages for each type of analysis you want to run. So the, that's where a lot of the functionality comes from. Now you can go ahead and you can do this in any way you want to. You can go ahead and click on the install icon in this lower right hand corner. And they can go ahead and say, okay, let's say I wanted Laban. I love this package, it's Bayesian instructional equation modeling. Uh, so I can go ahead and click on that and click on install. And it's going to go ahead and if I, it's going to update it because I'm already trying to install it right now. I already have it installed, but that's okay. And it downloaded and it's good to go. Whenever I, so think of it as it's kind of a two step phase. Whenever you're, you need to install it, but then you also need to activate the, the library too. So if you want to activate and so you can use the functions, you do library, parentheses, and then the package name. And that's going to go ahead and activate. So now all the functions that are built into this, now you can actually start using them. Without it, you can't.
So think of it as um, we have a let's say we have a light fixture, but we don't have any light bulb in there. Well, first we have to go out and we have to buy a light bulb. We put it in. That's the install packages. So once we have that, we don't need to go out and buy another light bulb because we already have one. Now we just turn on the light and now we can see. So think of the library as turning that switch, whereas install packages is putting the light bulb in. Once you have them installed, you really don't have to reinstall things. So the reason why in the template it has this long chunk is this is a really quick way to see it. What this does is it scans your computer and sees, okay, what do you already have installed? If anything is missing within this list of packages, it's going to go ahead and automatically install for you. If it's already installed, it's going to skip it. So that way you're not going to install each and every time. It just scans it. So I love this because it saves a lot of time. Also, this is a kind of a pain to type in a live coding session and make a lot of mistakes. That's why it's in the template one. So if you follow along, uh, if you're just watching visually follow along, that's great. If you want to go ahead and run this out and kind of do it in parallel too, go for it. I'm going to go ahead and run this. It's going to go ahead. So it scanned it. It's saying, here's my list of packages. If any of them are missing. So right now I don't, I don't have any new packages to install. So it essentially ends that code. If I had any packages that weren't installed yet, that's going to go ahead and automatically do that for me. Um, I like working with um, with rounded, so up to three decimal points. That's what I typically do. By default, it's going to give you a scientific notation. So this is kind of a quick option I like to use just to make sure like everything it reports is going to be not scientific notation, but rather rounded to three decimal points. You can change that. I just like using that. So now what we do is we can actually start activating libraries. Now that we have all of them installed. So we have Haven. That's going to allow us to import different data types. We have Tidyverse, which is a fantastic collection of other packages. So rather than activating like 14 of them, we can do Tidyverse and it will activate all of them at the same time. There's like data visualization, data inputting, data cleaning. So it's a lot of really great functions. Why hat I love this package. It's really good for OLS regressions. It has things like all possible subsets regression, beta weights, structure coefficients, um, dominance analysis, the relative importance weight. So it's really, really good. Just kind of looking also at your models as you run it. Uh, psych package is really good for descriptive statistics. We have the broom, which is really good for looking at model results, and performance, which is really good at model checking. There's a whole bunch of other ones here too. I'm gonna to kind of highlight as we go through. Um, a code booker, that's really good for creating and generating a code book. Oh, I realized I didn't show you all this. Whenever in that template one that you can see the end product, there's a whole bunch of files that went ahead and created. If you use in the template one, this one called code booker, and it creates a Word doc code book for all your variables in there. So, I mean, you probably want to go in and make some changes to it, like adding some additional information, but it saves a lot of time and energy into it. And you want to do this after your data is cleaned. But we'll jump back into that and we'll give that a try with it too. So, no, I'm going to activate these. That we can start doing that. Um, but before we can actually start working with data, because I know you all want to start working with it right away, is one of the hardest things besides installing R and getting everything talking to one another, because that's the big hurdle. The next big hurdle is working directories. So we always need to tell R where the files that we want to work out of, work with are located. A lot of times, um, whenever I see new R uses, this is usually what trips folks up the most. So I'm going to show you what I do personally. I, I kind of cheat with this, to be honest, because I I work on like three or four different computers with the same code. So the file paths are all going to be different. So what I personally do is I have all my files saved in a folder. So I have this AFW R materials folder that I want to work out of. But let's say I'm on a different computer. I have it downloaded, but I don't know the exact file path. What you can do, and what I personally do, is I always go to session, set working directory, and then choose directory. If I was in the documents, I can say, okay, where are my AFW tools? So I can go ahead and click on it. 
click on open. And there's the code I need to put in. So I'll do this. And I'm just going to go ahead, because it prints things out in this bottom console window. I'm going to go ahead and just highlight and copy it. And I'll paste it in there. Because now next time I run this, I can go ahead and just run that. And it will automatically do it. So that's how I kind of cheat the system. If I'm using multiple computers, like let's say the next one's on like a USB, like a D drive or an F drive, I can just go ahead and so right now with this, I'm adding a little hashtag here within the R block and that's commenting it out. So I can go ahead and change it depending on what system I'm using. So these are all little tricks and hacks that I use. So if it's helpful, go for it. A lot of times if, it, if you can't find the files, it's probably because you're not in the right directory. What you can also do is, because there's so many ways to do this with an R, whatever works out best for you is what you should do. There's also, if you click here on file, I can see where- There's a question. Um, oh, sure. in the, Jeff is asking, does setting the working directory work well with Dropbox? Let's see. So um, it depends. So if you have it linked, like a folder saved on Dropbox, it, like um, essentially you have a, I'm trying to think of the name for it. Uh, if you have it mapped onto your computer, then absolutely that works out fine. Same thing if you have it mapped to a Google Drive, that works out fine. If it's more looking at a trying to copy the the data set from it, there's a couple of different packages you can use that you just need the URL for it and have it be a shareable link. And then you can just go ahead and pull it there. Um, something that I'm not going to really cover here too, but let's say that you use, uh, if you use GitHub, the nice thing is R has built-in features where you can actually uh, clone a repo and then you can actually push and pull the jobs and push and pull stuff too. So if you make changes, it's really, really good, really recommended. Uh, but again, if you're working with like sensitive data, because you really don't want to have a huge data set on GitHub, uh, just because there's limitations to it. But yeah, if you're using uh, stuff on Dropbox, as long as it's mapped to your computer, you should be good to go. Uh, I do that a lot too, that in uh, Google Drive. Uh, if you run into any issues with setting that up, just let me know. I'm happy to troubleshoot that. So um, let's see. So yeah, if you use this file one, you can go ahead and double check and you can see, okay, am I in the right directory? Are these the files I would want to have? And looking at this, yeah, this all looks good. So the next thing we want to do is, well, we need to pull in our data set that we want to work with. So I have an example code here for like a CSV file. The code is super easy. If it's a state of a data set, easy too. These are kind of just depending on what ones you're going to be doing. We're actually going to be using an SPSS data set. So what I do here is I have to give the SPSS, the object I'm creating on my data set, a name. So I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to call this HS1939. And I'm just breaking the assignment symbol. And because I've already activated the Haven package, I can just do read underscore SAV, there it is, and I'm just going to go ahead and do double quotes, hs1939.sav, and if I run this, huh. oh, so I goofed up. I actually have it saved as hs.sav, so let me go ahead and change that. Ah, there we go. So I can actually see this now here. I have 300 observations of 15 variables. This is a kind of a quick preview of kind of what it looks like. So HS1939, that's the object name. If I wanted to look at a specific variable that, I'd use dollar sign and then the variable names. What you can also do is if you double click on the object name, this is what's called a view. So you can actually see like what we just saw in SPSS earlier. And I can see, okay, what does my data set look like? Did it import right? So I always recommend taking a quick peek at your data set just to make sure everything is correct within this. And I'm gonna show you a lot of different ways to do this. But that's one way you can do it. Let's say that you don't remember or you're not quite sure of how to import data. Um, that, that's honestly, I Googled a lot of stuff. If something, I'm, and even stuff I do a lot of, Sometimes I just go ahead and I Google it just to double check stuff. So Google is your friend. 
Um, let's say I wanted to figure out, well, what can I do in Haven? I can click on this lower right-hand corner and click on Packages. And if I go all the way down, again, I have a lot of stuff in here, probably stuff I've never used, to be honest, now that I'm thinking about it. Sometimes I just download packages just to see what they do. So I can click on Haven. The nice thing with this is every package, which is just a collection of functions that other people have made, it has to have a user guide, package vignettes, and example data sets, and documentation. So I can actually start looking at the examples. If I'm there, I can go ahead and, let's say I wanted to figure out, well, how do I read in an SPSS data set? This actually gives me information of how to use this, what all the arguments are and what options I have. Then all the way at the bottom, it has examples. That way I know, well, how do I actually use this? I can just copy and paste this out and then run it. Or you can just click here, which says run examples. And now I can actually start looking at it that way. So it really tries to make it as easy as possible. Um, what you can also do, is there's this upper ribbon. Do you see where it says import data set? If you click on that, you can actually, okay, if, let's say this is a, let's go ahead and use SPSS again. I can just go ahead and say, okay, where is the data set I wanna use? It's gonna go ahead and give me a quick preview of what does the data set look like. I can go ahead and name it. And then it's gonna go ahead and if I do this, it's going to import, and I have the code. So when it did that, if I, so I'll show that up one more time. So this is the code preview. I can just go ahead and copy this code, and I can do that as well. I'm just going to paste that within my script. So again, they try to make it as easy as possible within this. So it's there's multiple ways to do it you don't have to use the command all the time you can use this interface as well it's actually really helpful when you're first getting started with it because it's so because it is a syntax based language it's easy to make mistakes it'll be frustrating but the more and more you, you use it the quicker it will become and then it's it just becomes almost like second nature again i still google stuff just to be on the safe side and sometimes i forget how to do this stuff but now that we have it, I'm going to show you things. I'm going to make some edits now to my script and say, look at the structure of the data set. So one command I usually like is what's called str. So str is going to give you the structure. And I'm going to go ahead and just put hs1939. That'll be for the entire data set. And it tells me it's SPSS format. I have kind of information about if ID is numeric, age, and years is numeric. So I kind of see some of the coding schemes within this, as well as the first couple of instances. Let's see, we didn't do... Oh, so we have Broom already activated. Let me show you something else you can do too. So let me add in a new chunk. One of them that I really like is, I like using what's called the glimpse function. Uh, glimpse is from the Broom package, and I can do the data set. And as you start typing, it will try to auto, it will try to figure out what you're trying to put in as an object. So a glimpse, that's gonna give you, I think, the, I think this is much more succinct, because I can see is it a character, is it an integer, and it's essentially just a snapshot of the data. So this is a really handy thing. So we have that. Um, let's see. Uh, before we get a little bit more into data cleaning, I just want to check in. How's everyone doing? Um, any additional questions so far? Okay. How's um is the pace good so far? Good. Um, so I purposely didn't have my normal two pots of coffee today. So I'm, I'm trying not to go too fast. If I start going super fast, go ahead and just uh, wave me down and I'll, I'll put the brakes on a bit too. 
Um, so now that we went ahead and we've added this in there, let me go ahead and show you some, some fun stuff. So this is something I just found out about last week. It's called the skimmer package. This is something similar you can do where you can just get a brief idea of your data set. So because we haven't activated it, but how do you downloaded it? What we can do is we can actually just call a specific function from a package without activating everything. So that's like not really turning on a light, but sort of. So I, I start with the package name and then two colons. And then I can just do skim. And what this does is it gives me a data frame. So it actually skims the data. It lets me know what's the complete rate, how much is missing, the mean, standard deviation, different percentiles, and then a small, small histogram for each thing. So it's a really quick way to get an idea of your data set. There's some other things. So let's do a quick comparison. I'm going to show you the base R function for summary statistics. That's just called summary. And then we do our data set name or our object name. This is the default where we kind of see, OK, what does this look like? I personally don't like this. It, it doesn't have the standard deviation or the variance to me. It doesn't have skewness or kurtosis. So yeah, it's OK, but we can do better. So from the site package, we can go ahead and do what's called, let's see, describe. So what describe does is imagine that summary one, but it's a little bit more intense. So what it has is anything that is like a factor or a character, because we have grade, we have like school. Is it the um, pastor or grant white school? So because, oops, within that, it's actually you need to make some changes to the data because it's, I think it's numeric. But typically, if it's a character, we'll have a little asterisk. Well, you know, like you probably shouldn't use this one. But this gives us mean, standard deviation, median, min, maximum, the range, skewness, kurtosis, and the standard error of the estimate specifically over the mean for this one. So it does give a nice selection of descriptive statistics. But since we need to do some reformatting, I'm going to show you now how to go ahead and we'll do some quick reformatting because SPSS to R was OK, but we still want to make a couple of changes to this. So what I'm going to first do is I'm going to show you how to create a school variable because we saw before it didn't catch that school was actually a factor and a nominal, a nominal variable. So what I need to do is I need to fix that. So what I do is I'm gonna go ahead and say, okay, I'm gonna save my, my object name, which is my data frame, and then what variable I wanna edit. I'm gonna start with school for now. And I'm gonna do a sign symbol and then say, okay, factor, oops, factor. And now I'm going to go ahead and say, OK, I'm, I want to go ahead and I'm going to convert into the same variable, our school variable, and make some changes to it. That way, we'll actually read stuff in. So I'm going to say levels, because I know there's two, two schools. And I need to say it's 1, comma 2, because it's coded as 1 or 2 within this. And I'll say, rather than one, two, I'm going to have to be labeled. It makes it easier to work with. So I'll say labels equals C parentheses. And within there, I can go ahead and tag out grant white, which is one school. And our other school is pastor. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And now if I look over at the HS data set, their school says factor with two. If I go ahead and go to view it again, so that we have our schools in there initially. So I have the original one there. It was a one, two in the data set. So essentially I just recoded and used labels and told it, don't treat this as a numeric value. This is nominal. There's also no order to this as well. 
That's what we did. Now let's say I wanted to get frequencies for this. I'm going to go ahead and create a new chunk. Frequencies. It's always good to annotate as you go, especially for data cleaning that we have a track record of what you did and why. You can also add references to it. You actually, you can use like Zotero with this too and some other fun stuff. So what I do now is I can go ahead and just get an idea of what, what the table, what it looks like for frequency. I'm gonna go ahead and use the janitor package. And I'm only gonna use a specific function from that called table. So again, I'm, just, I'm saying what the package name is and what the function is. You can activate the whole function of the whole package and that's fine too. I do specific functions. If it's only one function I'm gonna use, I'll just cite it this way. And the reason for that is there's some packages where it actually, they use the same function names. So it creates a conflict. And whenever that happens is that the latest one that you activate is gonna be the one that it's gonna use that function name. So sometimes you want to use the early one rather than the later one. So sometimes you have to use this as a workaround. So now I'm gonna go ahead and just do my date, the, the table function from janitor. I'm gonna say, okay, I'm using my HS1939 data set or my object. I specifically want to look at school though. So when I do that, I get my number as well as my percentage. If I had any missing, you would see another row, an A, and then another column like cum or cumulative, or actually a corrected percentage, so not including those NAs. So if you have any missing data with this, we're perfectly fine. But that's a quick way to go ahead and get frequencies from this. Um, let's see, so we have that. There's... Let's see, so we have about a, a little under a half hour left. So do you all want to see like some different options for looking at some descriptive statistics and code books? Or do you want to kind of just jump into some analytics? Uh, what do you all want to do? Uh, feel free to go ahead if you want to unmute or if you want them in the chat, because uh, I, I want us to do whatever be the most beneficial and we'll go from there. Yeah, I'm okay with either too, but I'm curious about the analytics. Okay. Yes, yeah, so let's go ahead and we'll do some analytics then. So I'm going to start with just some, we're going to start with some basic univariate ones and then kind of start extending it. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of shortcuts. So if you're using, if you happen to submit a publication using APA format, there's a package I really like called APA tables. So I'm going to show you how to get a quick correlational matrix with means and standard deviations, and then write that out to a Word document. Uh, so this makes it a lot easier than having to like copy and paste from an Excel sheet and all that fun stuff. I've done that many times and it's so time consuming, uh, but it's only gonna work for continuous variables though. So just a word of caution with this. So what I do now is I'm gonna go ahead and say, okay, I'm gonna use the APA tables. And as I'm typing out the package name, it's gonna autofill. Now, I'm going to specifically want the APA dot core table. And I'm just going to say, do this on my Holzinger and Swineford data set that we started doing some cleaning with. And let's see. I'm going to run this twice. The first one, just to see what it looks like with an R. So it also gives asterisks using the, the conventions of less than 0 0.05, less than 0 0.01, and so forth. So, I mean, we could copy this out, but it's not the cleanest there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put this out into a Word document. So I'm going to do file name, and I'm going to call this my correlations. HS 1939. And I just need to say, okay, it's a dot, a doc X. Now, if I run this, so yeah, I printed here, but in my working directory, let me refresh it.
Uh, here we go. It might take a couple of seconds for it to go ahead and do that. Um, uh, maybe, I know what happened. Let me rerun this. And copy. Sometimes it doesn't want to play nice because we have it, it's open here. So I'm going to make a quick copy of it. So the joys of live coding, sometimes it works on the first try, sometimes it takes a little bit of, there we go. So I mistake, mistake, I put it as a doc X rather than a dot doc. So you wanna use a dot doc. Now, because this is, this looks okay, but I'm gonna go ahead and change the layout. So just landscape. Um, See, I'd probably start playing around with the margins a little bit, but that's just a rough assessment. It, it makes it a lot easier than trying to do all this manually. Again, because we have a good number of variables in here, I'd probably want to drop some of these in here that don't really make sense, like ID. I'd probably want to remove that. And I could just go ahead and create a duplicate data frame and just drop some variables. But it, it does save a lot of time and energy compared to just trying to do this manually. You also get the confidence intervals around your correlations for this as well, too. And you can go ahead and modify the note and then kind of just clean it up. So it's, it does save a good amount of time within that. So I'm all of the mindset, work smarter, not harder when it comes to R. It can also do things like different types of regressions as well. Uh, most of you are OLS, but that way you have a nice OLS formatted table, too. So We've done a little bit of correlation. Let's go ahead and let's do an independent samples t test. And let's say that I wanted to look at looking at my data set. Let's say I want to see are there school differences in visual perception scores? So these were a lot of different intelligence testing scores that were done in 1939. And we can just see, were there any school differences based on visual perception? So the first thing I'd want to do is I'd probably want to double check the quality of variances assumption first. So I'm going to call this um, LEV1 for Levine's test. And I'm going to use the car package and just say, OK, I want the Levine test. And I'm going to use this one. And then what we need to do is I'm going to say the outcome variable. So it's visual perceptions tilde school. Um, so when we get to regression, think of it as visual perceptions regressed on school to a degree. Because you can think of the entire general linear model like t-test, and over regression, it's all the same thing. It's just special case regressions. Um, so a lot of the scripting will kind of use that same mentality, which is really nice. So within this, because these are just variables, I don't need to put double quotes around it. I can just say, okay, what the data set is, I'm using the HS1939 data set. And I can then center using the mean. You can also use the median, which is actually slightly more robust. So I'm going to go ahead and just do the median. And I like to sometimes put it on separate lines from using different ones within this, just to make it clear. So we're running a Levine's test. We're storing the results as an object called lev1. And then what I want to do is I want to just print out lev1. So by typing the object name, it's going to go ahead and print it out for you. So I'm going to run this. Oh, that was my mistake. There's no object called 1930. It's 1939. Visual perception. So yeah, it's if you have really long variable names, the possibility of making a mistake, uh, as you can see, it happens. Okay, so looking at this, we have the homogeneous variances using the median. We have one degree of freedom. We have our F value within this, and it's um, our number of groups, minus one, 
So that's how we get in that. And this is not statistically significant. So, okay, good. Because of that, we can assume that there is not a significant difference between the variances of the groups on, uh, on the visual perception scores. So we can just use no correction with an RT test. I can go ahead and add a new chunk. And I can say, okay, now we can actually just run our t-test. But before we do that, let's say I want to get the descriptives for both groups. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the psych one. We don't necessarily have to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and just do it just as an example. There's a function called describe by within this. Now this is really great because you can just say the object name. So again, 1939 HS, HS 1939. And I'm going to do the visual perceptions, the grouping variable is HS 1939, specifically our school. And I'm going to say mat equals true. So by using mat equals true, it's all going to be on the same data frame, but now I can say, okay, group one, how many observations do we have? What was their mean? Their standard deviation. Minimum, maximum, and skewness in kurtosis. So this gives me a really nice snapshot of descriptive statistics by a grouping variable. So again, if you're using this though, you want to make sure that it's going to be a nominal variable that you're using as your group. So it makes it much easier to work with. Like also go ahead, like, okay, based on this, I'm gonna go ahead and run a t-test now. And so I'm gonna call this model one. And I'm going to do t dot test, and I'm taking our visual perception scores. It's going to be our grouping variable is going to be school. Our data is going to be HS nineteen thirty nine, and then what I want to do is there's a var equal command. So if I actually violate that assumption of homogeneity of the variances, I would just change this true to a false, and then we'll actually add the correction for you. So that's a really good thing to double check. And I'm gonna go ahead and do NA, NA dot. Hey, Eric. Yep. Just to let you know, there's a question in the chat saying, what does the trimmed column mean? Trimmed column, good question. So what I'm gonna do is, I believe that's the trimmed mean. Let me go ahead and double check that. So what I want to do is I'm just going to go to the packages like corner. And if I go all the way down to psych, the nice thing is there's documentation for each and every one of those. And in order for you to download it through Crane, which is what we did, they have to be, they're assessed. There's no malicious code in it. So that's never an issue you have to worry about within this. So it is, ah, here's psych. So I'm gonna go ahead and look by the describe. You can also use describe by, it's the same information. So describe. So trim, so trim means by dropping the top and bottom trim fraction. So it's essentially using the trimmed mean instead within this. Uh, so that's going to be that specific column. Um, so within this, we went ahead and it trimmed the mean by dropping the top and bottom trim fraction. By default, it's going to be 0.1. You can actually increase the trim or decrease it. So it's like kind of the outer ranges within it. Um, you can do that. What I'd instead probably use, I really wouldn't report the trim or use the trim personally. I would do different assessments to look for outliers first and create a, a dummy coded variable outlier is one, everything else is zero. And then use that and kind of see, okay, if I run, what do my descriptors look like with the outlier and then run it without the outlier? Now you can actually see what, what's the impact of that outlier on your descriptives. Uh, yeah, but looking at the trim, that's gonna be your trimmed mean within that. Really good question. Uh, something I wanna to mention too within this is, so this is uh, some R documentation. Like let's say you wanted to learn more about the psych package. If you just type in R and then the package name, you can actually pull up, there's sometimes there's vignettes, 
we can actually pull up the reference manual, which every package on Crayon has to have this. It's going to list every function. So if I wanted to learn how to use the dummy code function, it gives me a description. It gives me the usage and all the arguments. So same thing that we saw within this, this is um, a hard copy version rather than do it within R Studio. But then you can also look at the examples. Uh, so this is a really, really good way to kind of figure out what options you have within it too. Um, especially like that's if something I'm not recognized was in the output, I'll just pull up the documentation to go, okay, what's going on here? So again, really great question. So we have that. Um, oh, one thing I mentioned here too is NARM. So it's going to remove any missing data. Um, you really want to double check if there's any missing data first before you run it, but it's good things to kind of just double check. So I'm going to go ahead and run my t-desk and I can also print it here too because we're storing the object as or storing the results as an object there's different ways you can go ahead and yeah so summary on this one's not going to work on regression that works out better and then we can say okay here is our two sample t-test we have our t-statistic our degree of freedom our p-value it will also give you the alternative hypothesis cost interval and the sample means I like getting the standard deviations as well for each one and the variances. So that's why I do some additional work within it. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead. Oh, one thing too. If you're running a t-test and you have statistical significance, always, always, always report your effect size. Um, sorry, I'm a big proponent of that. I'm not a big fan of p-values personally. So I think it's always a good habit to report your, to always report that. So what I do is I'm going to show you a quick thing. So I'm copying all this in, a percent in the, the parentheses. I'm going to use what's called the R statics package. And they have a Cohen's D function. I'm just going to paste that. And that all looks good. I'm just going to get rid of NA matrix. We don't need that. And if I do this, it's going to say what the effect size is. It's also saying this is a negligible Cohen's D using different benchmarks by Cohen, which um, caution with benchmarks within that. But that way I can report this along with the statistical significance testing. Yeah, we found here, yeah, we did not find a difference. So I really wouldn't expect an effect size unless it maybe was really underpowered as well. That's a whole other thing. Um, I'm going to just skip right to regression because I love regressions. And we already have some of this here too. So what I want to do first is I'm going to go ahead and activate some packages. First, I'm going to create a new chunk. I'm going to do library. Then I want the car library y hat. And then library oops and i can tell that it didn't type this in right because it's not the same color so they do have some nice color codings that really help it use you to kind of debug things but let's say i have this in craft like this and i try to run it it's gonna say oh there's no function that's called that so r tries to make it helpful to kind of debug things i'm gonna use lm test so these are some nice different tools that you have Within this. Remember I mentioned before that if it's the same functions, it will kind of overwrite. So it's saying it's masking from different ones, like car, they have something called logit. So it's not going to be using the site one. The recode from car, so we're not going to be using the dplyr one. So that's when that happens. So we probably want to do like descriptive statistics, box plots, and all that stuff. Um, we're going to skip ahead a little bit and just start running a model because I want to show you some different things you can do within that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start running a, just a standard ordinary least squares regression. I'm going to call this OLS because I'm not really original with my names. Now, what you'd want to do is you have to say it's the LM function. That means linear model. I'm going to do visual perception regressed on, I'm going to say school. Now, because school is binary, it's going to automatically use the dummy coding within that. It's going to use your first level as your reference group. 
If you need to change that, there's code that you can go ahead and just flip your reference groups though. Now reference groups should be determined based on theoretical decisions though. I'm going to go ahead and say also the cubes and I'm going to put in lozenges. Actually, I'm going to say, you know what? I think there's going to be an interaction between these. So I can do that. And then I can go ahead and say, okay, within this, my data set is HS1939. And I can run that. So now I've actually already run my OLS. I have an object called it. It's an old list though. So now I can actually see, okay, let me see what we have here. By default, you're probably gonna use what's called the summary command. This is just your basic one. You have your, this is your equation. You have your information about your residuals, and then your coefficients. Uh, so it also tells you the asterisk, we have, do we have statistical significance? We do have a significant interaction between cubes and lozenges. Uh, school holding all the other variables constant. There was no difference between Pastor and Grant White, which we saw earlier with the heat test. So that's not surprising. We have our overall, this is our squared. F statistic and p value. It's like, okay, that's pretty good. But I like some additional stuff in there too. So I can use that glance function from Broom. And I can actually get my information about my model as a data frame itself. So if you're running a lot of models, you can actually put that all into a data frame and report that. There's, let's say you wanted to extract the coefficients like into an Excel sheet, what you could do is I'm gonna create a new object called OLF, OLF COLF. And then what I can do is I refer to the name of the object and get the coefficients. So I'm storing that and then write CSV OLS COLF and file equals color OLS dot CSV. And you know what, oh, before I do that, I wanna see what it looks like. So here I'm extracting from my model all my coefficients. These are gonna be your unsterilized coefficients. will be an intercept. It's gonna print it out and it's also gonna write it as an Excel sheet or CSV. So now I have my OLF See, here's my OLS coefficients I just made. I'm gonna go ahead and have that open up in a second. But it also gave me the intercept. So it has all of those here too. But now I also have a data frame where I have my intercept in each of my variables in the interaction and my unstandardized coefficients. So that's pretty handy. Um, we can also do things like some model checks. So you can like check models from the performance package. I can just type in OLS. And then this gives you, I love this package so much, a quick snapshot about multicollinearity, normality of residuals, if there's potential outliers, linearity. So it's a, a larger view within this. But I can then go ahead and say, okay, within each of these, so let me find the performance package. I can then do a little bit more precision within this. The nice thing is like, let's say that you run, you think there might be some heteroscedasticity. We can actually check for that specifically. We can check for normality specific, check with outliers. So if we do, we check, Elasticity, OLS. It's going to say, okay, error variance is repeatedly homoscedastic. So it actually it will run that and give you a significance test directly. Um, it also look at if you're doing like a Poisson, if you look for over dispersions, um, if you're doing Bayesian regressions, they have posterior predictive checks. So it is super, super helpful for model diagnostics and assumption checks. And it just makes it really easy to use. So I do like that visual where it's like kind of that larger visualization, but then I always follow up with kind of more 
the drill down assumption checks within each of those. The, the last thing I want to show you is a package I love, full disclosure. Um, when I was in grad school, one of the professors who actually wrote this program was there. So this is at the Y Hat package. I really love it because it's a lot of stuff I was trained in. It's um, looking at structure coefficients and beta weights. So if you're dealing with multicollinearity, if you report those, you don't really have to worry about dropping variables or issues of multicollinearity. So I really, really love it. Some people don't love it. So it kind of, it depends with what you want to do. So I can go ahead and do reg R, and that's from the white hat package. And then I would just say, okay, I type in my OLS information. And what I get here is it gives me a whole lot of information. So I get my normal output here, but I also get the beta weights, the standardized coefficients. It calculates my structure coefficients, which is how much each variable could have accounted for in the model, rather than how much it was given credit. So the given credit's more the beta weights. It runs a commonality analysis. So all possible combinations, what that looks like, and how much the variance accounted for, other oh, variance explained is accounted for within like how much is a variance is unique to school? How much is unique to cubes? How much of the explained variance is unique to lozenges? This is a, a quick thing of a variance as percentage of a percentage. Oh, I see a good question about is there a way to easy way to view VIF in R? So personally, what I would do is I would use I'd use the performance package. Hey, oh sorry, Eric. Um yep. so we've got another um, question in the chat, is there an easy way to view F, I'm um, sorry, VIF yeah. in R? Yeah, in uh, R. Yeah. I was actually just about to answer that. If, uh, so what I would do is I'd use the performance package for that. Um, so you're checking VIF or variance inflated from this. I would do just check underscore, and then that's going to be multi-collinearity, or I think they call it collinearity. Yeah, OLS. So if you run that, it's going to give you your VIF and your tolerance. And it's going to calculate, is it low, moderate, to high? Now, the high one here is because we have that interaction. So that's going to artificially inflate. So I'd expect to see a collinearity. Uh, personally, if I needed to report VIF, I would use uh, this function. And that's within the performance one. So Jay, really great question. Um, to be honest, though, what if there's multicollinearity for OLS, I typically don't worry about it uh, because I tend to report beta weights and structure coefficients, and then that that bypasses a lot of that issue. Uh, so there's a fantastic paper by it's, uh, Corville and Thompson, and I think that's 2004. Uh, there's also, if you type in to Google Crepe at all, uh, 2011. That's a really good one. So Gray et al. has tools to handle multicollinearity. Full disclosure, Amanda Gray, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic person. Uh, she's the one who got me interested in statistics, the quantitative method specifically. She was the grad student who kind of took me under her wing and said, here's some really cool stuff. And so I, I owe her so, so much. Uh, so there's some good citations too. So really, really good question, Jay. Um, again, not all folks like the structure coefficient method to handle multicollinearity. I really do, though. So again, if you use that, you just want to have a citation. So those, those should be some good citations. Uh, if you need more, just send me an email, let me know, and happy to send some more over to that. Um, we're almost out of time, so I want to see, is there any other questions that folks have? And I know we covered a whole lot of ground, too. So um, it, it, like, feel free to play around the code. You, you can't really break R or R Studio. It might just get some error messages, but give it a try. Uh, try different things within it. Um, if you have specific questions too, always happy to answer them. Um, and yeah, just let me know, what do you think? What do you think of R so far? If you want, I can go ahead and, um, let's go ahead and pause the recording. And then, if, so folks, have any questions or any thoughts that way,